We're going to finish out the semester by talking about software engineering concepts. So if you uh, remember where we've been here, that uh, again, we've been talking about scheduling of periodic tasks. We also talked a little bit about uh, scheduling of sporadic tasks, um, tasks that were aperiodic. Um, and then uh, we started to talk a little bit about communication and synchronization. Um, and then we kind of set the stage for uh, software and, and functional specifications. So now we're going to talk really about software engineering methods. Um, and uh, we're going to start off talking a little bit about software lifecycle. Uh, but then really the meat of this um, is specification methods specifically. And here are some of the ones uh, that we're going to be talking about here, natural language, flowcharts, etc. Um, and uh, what we're going to see is that these are actually broken into several types. We have informal methods, we have semi-formal methods, and then we actually have formal methods which you can uh, generate uh, proofs on and, and that sort of thing. So this is good from the standpoint of being able to um, really um, do verification validation from its software models. Okay. Um, now, general software lifecycle is uh, ideally we've always talked about in software engineering the waterfall model where you start from uh, concept, you kind of flow in, you know, conceptual design, concept ideas, you flow into requirements, you start to do design and then programming of, of components, you test and eventually deploy your system, and then you go into a maintenance phase, okay? Um, and that's kind of this, and that's, they call this the, the a waterfall model because you kind of flow from step to step in the process. Now, that's the ideal world. Um, and uh, again, what these things mean is the concept phase is when you explore the needs and the goals. Uh, you talk to management. You look at what are the management directives, what are the overall goals of the, of the company or the product or the project or whatever it is. You know, you get customer input. You look at technology and, and the technologies they have, the technologies they're prepared to maintain, etc. Um, and of course, you know, what you're trying to pull out here is what are the features that, uh, that is really needed for the, uh, the product or the a project, whatever it is. Um, and again, you look a little bit at feasibility of uh, different aspects of the design. And again, this is a design process. When you're talking about software engineering, you're talking about a design process. Um, and you're looking at these things, both features and feasibility, from the standpoint of, of design and as well as testing. And also when you talk about features and feasibility, of course, this is part of the concept phase. So, you know, it has to be relevant to the customer um, expectations, the customer capabilities. Um, and so, you know, you have to make sure that the design and the testing are feasible, not only uh, uh, possible, but feasible within the customer's framework. So from that, from that kind of concept phase, where you're a lot of gather, data gathering and kind of understanding the problem, then you, you transition into the requirements phase. Um, and, uh, you know, from a standpoint of software specification, you know, you're going to consider uh, things like timing of, uh, uh, timing of the, the, the software, whatever the functionality is in terms of the accuracy that you need to achieve, what the user interface is going to be and how, what's the uh, capabilities of the operator. Um, you also have to talk about software hardware interfaces. Um, again, you're trying to design the specs for the software so that you can then code, do the design and implementation. Um, and you're interested, again, you've got, you've got characteristics that we mentioned in the timing, accuracy, user interface. There's the hardware software interfaces are, you know, what are the type of user inputs? What are there going to be sensors? Is it active? Um, again, we're all doing this under the, the uh, in the domain of, of real-time systems. Now, also part of this software specification, um, you have to uh, consider a testing plan, um, debugging and testing, ver verification and validation of the code. Does it meet the specs? And finally, of course, there's a question of budget and schedule. Um, and this is a part where you're, uh, again, going to be uh, specifying What's the cost? How long is it going to take? What are the phases? 
Okay, um, and these you have to do this in consideration of both functional and non-functional requirements. Um, and uh, what we mean by that is, um, in examples, you know, timing, accuracy, right? Those are functional requirements. The user interface, you know, that is, um, you know, an, an aspect of of choice, aesthetics, and uh, the potential audience, right? So it's not so much a functional requirement um, as it is a, uh, um, but it's but it's a requirement nonetheless, right? To be appropriate for the users of the system. Um, and again, then we're just going through the phases that that remember we represented in this wire uh, the waterfall model, right? The concepts, and these are all the standard phases of of design, really. Um, so there's the design phase, right? You're converting those requirements to a detailed design spec. Um, you partition out the various modules that can go together. Again, we're thinking of this from the software engineering uh, um, lifecycle process. Um, and, and design phase generally is going to have a couple of different steps, you know, in terms of, of high level design and then increasing levels of detail and programming then is the actual implementation in a hardware design, you know, that's, that's going to be your fabrication step, right? Programming is the fabrication step of software engineering, whereas mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, you know, that's the actual fabrication. But what you're doing then is converting this design and these modules actually into um, the various elements of code, the subroutines, the uh, data structures, um, databases, and things like that um, to implement this. Um, you're going to be doing incremental tests uh, along the way, and documentation, of course, is critical uh, throughout this, um, and even in the, in the earlier phases, right? But, but uh, you're really going to be documenting uh, code. And, of course, um, we have in our real-time and embedded systems class, you know, I have some specific uh, documentation requirements that you have to be conscious of. Um, and, you know, which involves, you know, there's, there's commenting of code, there's uh, um, software engineering tools we're going to be using to uh, specify how the code operates. You uh, do comments throughout your code, both at the file level, at the uh, subroutine level, and then at the variable or the, the uh, step level, um, as documented on the web. Um, and to make sure that, that not only are you coding it well, but you're leaving the tracks so that other people can maintain this software. And then, of course, you get into the formal test phase. Remember, during programming, you're going to be doing incremental tests, right? Um, you're going to be verifying that what you've coded is correct and that it works and that it's functional. Now, but the test phase is when we get into more formal test cases. That's based on the design document. Those are based on the specs and, uh, and the high-level design. Um, and that's what you're trying to do, right? This is a verification. Does it meet the specs? Um, and then beyond that, when you get toward the, uh, again, now, now we're getting into deployment. Once we verified and validated the software, um, this uh, um, section down here in maintenance, you know, that's when you're going to have potential bug fixes, customer support. That sort of thing. Um, and, and so that's what the software engineering life cycle is all about. Now, in reality, um, it never really flows quite that simply. Um, this idea of the waterfall model, while well, idealized and, and cute, this is what a typical design looks like, right? You go at, start at the concept phase and uh, you're uh, trying to come up with, um, you know, what really are the requirements and you find out there are all kinds of uh, problems that normally, um, you know, the, the waterfall model is kind of these green arrows, right? Where you just hop from phase to phase in a nice, simple, orderly process. And uh, what, but what really happens is when you go through the concept phase, you go into requirements and you realize, oh, wait a minute, you know, we didn't think this through. I, we can't figure out, um, you can't even specify what we've come up with. So you have to re-specify, you know, what the concept is really about, to develop the requirements. Again, you, after the requirements are done, you want to go into the design phase, but then you might find, oh, some of these things are, are features are just not feasible. Um, there may be problems. 
um, in developing the concept that you realize, wait a minute, there's a fundamental problem here. Um, uh, you know, we're violating a fundamental law of physics or something like that. Um, or just, you know, verifying, wait a minute, this isn't going to work for the way the operators expect it, right? Um, and so um, it's this constant back and forth, even at all phases. You can get all the way down to the testing phases, and then you go realize that, oh, my goodness, you know, the, 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 there's a problem with the requirements. We, we can't. We thought we had everything mapped out. And, uh, in fact, uh, we can't uh, meet the uh, um, specifications or something. And you may go all the way back to the concept phase. And so, you know, you can have errors in coding, even though you did expect, um, incremental tests down here in the programming phase, you may get into testing and realize, oh, wait, nope, not, the, the, you know, some major problem you have to, or, or even a minor problem, right, that, that may have multiple side effects. And so you have to go back and reprogram, and then you're going to have to retest everything. There might be errors in design that cause you to go all the way back here, and then, and again, finally get into a, a maintenance phase. And then even after the thing's been deployed for a while, you may realize, whoops, wait a minute, there's a problem that keeps coming up. Um, and that got through the testing phase, right? And so all of this thing, and then, of course, you know, it's, it's cyclic because in companies, you know, we never keep the same product forever. Um, so, uh, you may, you know, after you're in the maintenance phase, now you have to start work with marketing and with sales and say, okay, what does it lack? What do we need to do next? Um, so all of these issues are, are what make the, the design process really difficult and the need for documentation, the need for good software engineering practices, um, is this is really why we need it. If it worked like the waterfall model, just, you know, go from these green lines, um, from phase to phase, um, there wouldn't be so much need for, uh, good documentation, but sadly, this is the reality. Um, and that means um, there's an opportunity, right, for us as software engineers. Um, and so, um, as the uh, uh, kickoff sheet, uh, kickoff slide said, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about a number of different methods. Um, natural language. Natural language specification is a great thing. Um, this is the, the basis of our commenting and, and, and basic documentation. So, you know, starting out with just a written description of functionality. Um, this is critically important, um, and it's a required step. Do it, right? Um, you're going to be expected to do it in your homework assignments. You're going to be expected to do it in labs. You're going to be expected to do it. Um, and so it's required, but it should be redundant. And redundant in the sense that you should pick another mechanism to also um, specify uh, your, your software engineering design, because Natural language, it's not testable, it's difficult to interpret. Um, there are multiple possible interpretations. Everyone, uh, you know, uh, uh, human language is not that precise. Um, and that's why um, it's very important, you know, written documentation in the form of comments and ex explanations in your language of choice, right, is, again, sh is required, but you want it, don't want it to be the only form of uh, specification. Um, mathematical specifications are um, important as well, you know, um, algorithms, what your code is doing, uh, but also how it performs and how it operates. Um, and in some cases, this provides, you know, math is rigorous. Um, it provides provable tools. We're not going to talk about mathematical specification too much other than, um, you know, just a potential type of algorithm you're going to be uh, um, implementing, like, for example, a PID control loop, right? Well, that has a very clear formula associated with it. Um, but uh, we're going to focus more on the other aspects of software, uh, software design. Um, Flowcharts are this um, uh, well understood uh, uh, and, and well used, uh, whoops, sorry, um, form of uh, software specification. Um, and one problem is, um, while it is well as um, it's intuitive and well understood, it does promote the use of go-to statements. Go-to statements, um, although technically there's nothing wrong with them, um, they do uh, have a tendency to uh, make code difficult and uh, result difficult to understand if you can just kind of randomly hop through uh, um, the uh, execution. But also. Uh, subject for uh, um, 
hidden bugs that can cause problems. Um, another problem with flow charts is that the parallel flow um, is just not easily represented. And likewise with timing issues. Um, and so we won't talk, actually use flow charts so much in real time and embedded systems because you just can't represent the timing issues very well.